We can now join the components of our analysis of being in the world into a coherent whole. Our characterizations of default human beingness as thrown projection, care, being towards death and being guilty, are complementary views of the same ontological structure from different angles. But one of our goals remains unfulfilled. We still require existential proof that a person stuck in inauthentic being is capable of attaining integrity. If our analysis is accurate, the voice of conscience articulates the call. The call is a hint within our everyday existential inauthenticity that we are anxious about our potential for authentic existence. It is the voice of our repressed but still existing capacity for genuine selfhood. But if that capacity is genuinely repressed, how can it speak out? If we can hear the call, its repression must already have been lifted. We must have already discovered our possibility of authentic being, no matter how minutely. The central difficulty is that we conceive of our default being as inherently split. Human beings are capable of living authentically or inauthentically. Either we are lost in the distractions of the other while retaining the capacity for wrenching ourselves away from it, or we have realized the existential possibilities expressing our real individuality while still remaining vulnerable to falling back into the world. We retain this dual nature as long as we are in the world, that is, as long as we are alive. The transition from inauthentic to authentic being therefore involves an internal shift in emphasis. The urge for genuine individuality must come to eclipse the habits of inauthentic being. Without some help, this transition can only be brought about by our own resources, but overcoming our self-imposed darkness by ourselves seems impossible. Indeed, our experience does not confirm this possibility. The call must come from outside ourselves, from someone who is with us in the world, but is not lost in the world. The call of conscience must be articulated externally by someone else, someone who diagnoses us as lost and has an interest in our overcoming inauthenticity and freeing our capacity to live a genuinely individual life. This external intervention disrupts our self-reinforcing dispersal in the other, recalling us to our own authentic possibilities. The call of conscience, though it may actually come from within, is perceived to be external. The caller's aim is to help us recover our capacity for selfhood, our autonomy. He does not wish to impose upon us a specific blueprint for living, or replace our present servitude to the other with servitude to himself. His only aim is to remind us of our capacity for individuality, to urge us to listen to the demands of our authenticity. In so doing, he functions as an external representative of an aspect of ourselves, his call being proxy for our potential for authenticity. This call is now repressed, but it nonetheless constitutes our most true self. In that sense, the caller speaks from within us, echoing the voice of our conscience. The voice of another person, whose reticent tone acknowledges our own inner voice, would be perceived by us as possessing exactly the phenomenological characteristics defining the call of conscience. We perceive that the call comes from within us, and yet from beyond us. It seems like the voice of a dear familiar friend we carry within our hearts. But if our inauthentic state renders us incapable of hearing the call of conscience, how can we hear the same call made by another? 
if part of our lostness is loss of any conception of ourselves as capable of any being other than being in the world, how could the call of the friend penetrate our repression of our authenticity? If it could, then surely we must already have begun the very transition that the reception of the call is supposed to initiate. Clearly, if the friend is to be heard, he must first create the conditions for his own audibility. But how? Our selfhood is lost in the other. There is no ontological differentiation in the impersonal other between self and other, and so no internal self-differentiation in its members. Lacking any conception of authentic being, we conflate our existential potential with our existential actuality and repress our feeling of uncanniness. However, when we encounter an authentic friend, his authentic mode of existence disrupts the undifferentiated mass of the other. The selfhood of the friend is not lost in slavish mechanical identification with, or slavish differentiation from, others. The friend does not mirror our impersonality, for that would confirm it. He simply prevents us from relating to him inauthentically. We can mirror another who exists as individual and self-determining, and who relates to us genuinely, only by relating to him as other, and to ourselves as other to that other. That is, the authentic friend allows us to relate to him only as a separate, self-determining individual. An encounter with a genuine other disrupts our lostness by awakening otherness in ourselves. Our relation to that other overcomes our habitual assumptions of self-identity and instantiates a mode of self-relation as other. It induces an anxious realization of ourself as a separate, self-responsible being with a life of our own that we must lead. And so we realize our existence as our own, non-relational and inevitable. This amounts to anxious acknowledgement of our mortality, the existential pivot from self-dispersal to self-integrity. The fact of the friend's existence creates in us the precise conditions for hearing his call to real individuality as an echo or reflection of our own voice of conscience. Our conception of our default being as split, with its capacity for authenticity eclipsing or being eclipsed by its capacity for inauthenticity, applies to almost everyone in the world. People everywhere are immersed in the prevailing inauthentic modes of everyday life, of being in the world. Everyone we meet in ordinary life is inauthentic, although capable of authenticity. However, outlining an insightful fundamental ontology of our being necessarily is an act of authentic being. Such a thing can be done only by someone who, while not being immune to the temptations of inauthenticity, has achieved an authentic mode of human existence. Providing such a fundamental ontology to you is an attempt to facilitate your transition from inauthentic to authentic being. Thus, our relation to you precisely matches the model of the voice of conscience, the call of the friend, as we have termed it. We attempt to echo the voice of conscience to you, acting as a representative of your own capacity for authentic being. We do not want to present you with blueprints for living. Rather, we confront you with a portrait of yourself as mired in inauthenticity, call you to knowledge of yourself as capable of authentic thought, and encourage you to overcome your repression of that capacity and to think for yourself. Our presentation offers the call of the friend as a pivot for self-transformation, as a mirror that reflects your present inauthenticity,
and as a medium through which you might attain authenticity. It is practically impossible for anyone to originate their own rebirth. Of course, in claiming the capacity to present a fundamental ontology of being, we claim a position of authenticity, implicitly declaring ourselves as having transitioned from an inauthentic to an authentic mode of existence. Yet, we cannot present ourselves as having done so entirely on our own resources. We have not single-handedly created this fundamental ontology and this deconstruction of the way of being in the world that we inherited. We cannot misrepresent our achievement as solely and exclusively our own. In particular, we cannot ignore the role our teachers played in the origination of our thinking and investigations, for they in turn represented the voice of conscience and originated the call to us. Let us recall how our analysis of conscience and guilt confirms the implication of our analysis of death. In the act of being, we are internally related to nothingness, non-existence, and negation. To say that we are being guilty is to say that we are the basis of a nullity, the absence of something, and hence that the ground of our projections will always exceed our grasp. The voice of conscience is our discourse with the friend of the heart in the mode of silence. It reveals that discourse as a dimension of significance beyond the possibilities of any speech act. Authentic listening doesn't demand anything specific to happen in the world, and so there is nothing specific that could constitute its satisfaction. Any specific existential demands we think we hear from the voice of conscience are solely our misinterpretation of its silence. The silent voice of conscience actually condemns our subjection to demand as unredeemable through satisfying any specific demand. Authentic being is not to respond to any particular demand made by the other, but to choose a possibility in any situation that is distinctively ours alone. The voice of conscience speaks against our habitual tendency to conflate our existential potential with our existential actuality. It silently opens up our internal otherness, our relation to ourselves as other. This means we are not self-identical, but rather transitional or self-transcending. This implies that inauthenticity is a matter of our enacting an understanding of ourself as essentially self-identical, as capable of coinciding with ourselves and fulfilling our nature. Thus, our being is perpetually incomplete, always already projecting into future possibilities. This internal split between our present and future self can be resolved only by attaining integrity, where each choice we make is in the consciousness of the realization of impending death that we explored in being in the world. We must find the friend of the heart and submit our impulses, ideas, and desires to his advocacy and the judgment of conscience before actualizing them. That is the clear path to ontological integrity and complete authenticity. However, this is impossible without the help of the external friend, a person who has realized his own authentic being. <laughs>